video was originally recorded May 2018 at Tibet House US in New York City. To watch more videos from this program, please visit TibetHouse.us. I want to come back. I'm going to stop after. I have two more things, if I'm not taking too much time. Um, I want to come back to poetry and a little more, a little more uh, starting with the uh, uh, anxiety, depression, and addiction piece that uh, many of us, uh, many of us grow up having, you know, like coming into our minds that's what we have is anxiety, or that's what we find ourselves acting out is addiction, or that's what we feel is depression and we don't understand, but we're kind of gripped by, uh, by it, and then we have a lifetime of psychotherapy or of meditation or of uh, um, AA or just of drowning ourselves uh, or starving ourselves or whatever we might do um, trying to figure it out. So this is, um, uh, this is about a poet uh, named Louise Gluck, whose work I didn't know before I read this piece in The New Yorker, but it really moved me, and then I got a little more familiar with her work. So I'm just going to read you some bits and pieces uh, about the poet Louise Gluck. Uh, she was born in 1943 in New York City and was raised on Long Island. A sister died before Gluck was born. Her death was not my experience, but her absence was, Gluck writes in an essay. Her death let me be born. That severity of judgment is typical of her. She often pairs experience down to brutal cause and effect. Gluck sought her mother's approval exclusively, approval that was usually withheld. Her father, who had helped bring the exacto knife to market, was a worldly success with buried literary ambitions. A younger sister appears in Gluck's poems, sometimes as an ally, often as rival. Much of life for Gluck is livable only when hostile factions lay aside their arms. It is a view of social life as driven not by altruism, but by truce, and it was formed in that home. When she was 16, Gluck, suffering from anorexia, nearly starved herself to death. Her formal schooling was sporadic from that moment forward. She spent seven years in psychoanalysis, but that's a short amount of time, and eventually apprenticed herself to two poets, first Leone Adams, then Stanley Kunitz, both of whom she met during a brief period at Columbia. Anorexia seems to have been a clumsy early form of writing poetry, focusing exclusively and therefore tragically on form. <clears throat> Analysis, which replaced anorexia by describing it, would then be an improvement, except that it had no form. Its truths were inert and abstract. Only in poetry could the formal manifestations of insight be explored, a fact that she explores in form in a section of uh, an essay called, or a poem called Dedication to Hunger. This is her poem, part of the poem. It begins quietly, in certain female children, the fear of death, taking as its form dedication to hunger. Because a woman's body is a grave, it will accept anything. I remember lying in bed at night, touching the soft, digressive breasts, touching at 15 the interfering flesh that I would sacrifice until the limbs were free of blossom and subterfuge. I felt what I feel now aligning these words. It is the same need to perfect, of which death is a mere byproduct. I could read it again, but I'll go on. The, so now the person who's writing the, uh, the essay about her. Blossom is what grown-ups say little girls, sorry, little girls' bodies do. To the girls, it feels more like subterfuge. The pair of words reveals so much about what drove Gluck in poems like this one, the need to perfect certainly, but what poet doesn't feel some version of that need? Gluck's provocative difference was to link perfection with forms of defiance, 
as she writes in another essay, Education of the Poet. By the time I was 16, a number of things were clear to me. It was clear that what I had thought of as an act of will, an act I was perfectly capable of controlling, of terminating, was not that. I realized that I had no control over this behavior at all. And I realized, logically, that to be 85, then 80, then 75 pounds was to be thin. I understood that at some point I was going to die. Even then, dying seemed like a pathetic metaphor for establishing a separation between myself and my mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is, a, it's not just anorexia, like I think any kind of addiction, uh, the sense that, oh, you're doing it on purpose, but then at some point you realize that actually you don't have control over your behavior at all, and that in fact you're acting out something and you don't even know what it is. Um, and, and then the effort of therapy or of even of meditation practice or certainly of writing, of poetry, is to try to make some kind of sense of oneself, which she is doing. So here's another one of her poems. As I saw it, all my mother's life, my father held her down, like lead strapped to her ankles. She was buoyant by nature. She wanted to travel, go to theater, go to museums. What he wanted was to lie on the couch with the times over his face so that death, when it came, wouldn't seem a significant change. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is the end of the essay. There's plenty to be sad about in Gluck's recent work. We expect her to be adept at delivering bad news. But all that severity is paying some tremendous dividends now in a poet who has been on record about misery all along. These new poems are funny, abundantly social, and often where we expect a bitter judgment merciful. Here she is in fugue, remembering a child's game of family. I was the man because I was taller. My sister decided when we should eat. From time to time, she'd have a baby. <laughs> Later, in the same poem, she tells a dream. I had a dream my mother fell out of a tree. After she fell, the tree died. It had outlived its function. <laughs> and in Crossroads, one of many sublime lyrics, after a lifetime of combating her body, she makes the most unlikely truce of all. My body, now that we will not be traveling together much longer, I begin to feel a new tenderness toward you, very raw and unfamiliar, like what I remember of love when I was young. Mm. So I think that's what we can hope for, at the very least. Um, and can I read one more thing? Yeah, why not? You, all right. Are you okay with all this? Yeah. Okay. So, just today, I got this book by, do you know who Karlov Navsgard is? Yes. Karlo, you know Karlov Navsgard? Um, Norwegian writer of a six volume uh, series uh, called My Struggle, Depressed. where he yeah. details every, uh, every moment of his, every moment edited at, make, as a novel of his uh, growing up and uh, having children and his alcoholic father and his depressed mother oh and um, his own. Anyway, um, he has a new book that just came out called Spring where he's writing to his uh, newborn baby. Um, and uh, I just read the beginning of it today uh, and it's wonderful, so I'll read it to you because I don't think you will have seen it yet. He's writing to his three-month-old. You don't know what air is, yet you breathe. You don't know what sleep is, yet you sleep. You don't know what night is, yet you lie in it. You don't know what a heart is, yet your own heart beats steadily in your chest, day and night, day and night, day and night. You are three months old, and as if swaddled in routines, you lie on a bed of sameness through the days. For you don't have a cocoon like larvae do. You don't have a pouch like the kangaroos. You don't have a den like the badgers or the bears. You have your bottle of milk. You have the changing table with nappies and wet wipes. You have the pram with the pillow and the duvet. You have your parents' large, warm bodies. Surrounded by all this, you grow so slowly that no one notices, least of all yourself. For first, you grow outwards by gripping and holding on to the things around you with your hands, your mouth, your eyes, your thoughts, thereby bringing them into being. 
And only when you have done this for a few years and the world has been constituted do you begin to discover all that grips you and you grow inwardly too towards yourself. What is the world like to a newborn baby? Light, dark, cold, warm, soft, hard. The whole array of objects in a house, all meaning deriving from the relations within a family, the significance that every person dwells within, all this is invisible, hidden not by the darkness but by the light of the undifferentiated. Someone once told me that heroin is so fantastic because the feelings it awakens are akin to those we have as children when everything is taken care of, the feeling of total security we bask in then, which is so fundamentally good. Anyone who has experienced that high wants to experience it again since they know it exists as a possibility. The life I live is separated from yours by an abyss. It is full of problems, of conflicts, of duties, of things that have to be taken care of, handled, fixed, of wills that must be satisfied, wills that must be resisted and perhaps wounded, all in a continual stream where almost nothing stands still but everything is in motion and everything has to be parried. I am 46 years old and that is my insight, that life is made up of events that have to be parried and that the moments of happiness in life all have to do with the opposite. What is the opposite of parrying something? It isn't to regress, it isn't to withdraw into your world of light and dark, warm and cold, soft and hard, nor is it the light of the undifferentiated. It is neither sleep nor rest. The opposite of parrying is creating, making, adding something that wasn't there before. You were not there before. Love is not a word I often use. It seems too big in relation to the life I live the world I know. But then I grew up in a culture that was careful with words. My mother has never told me she loves me and I have never told her I love her. The same goes for my brother. If I were to say to my mother or my brother that I love them, they would be horrified. <laughs> I, would, I would have laid a burden on them, violent, violently upsetting the balance between us, almost as if I had staggered around in a drunken fit during a child's christening. When you were born, I knew nothing about you, yet I was filled with feelings for you, overwhelming at first, for a birth is overwhelming, even to someone who is merely looking on. It is as if everything in the room grows denser, as if a kind of gravity develops that draws all meaning towards it, so that for a few hours it can only be found there, later becoming more evenly spread out, subjected to the everyday, diluted with the eventlessness of all the hours of the day, and yet always there. I am your father and you know my face, my voice, and my ways of holding you. But beyond that, I could be anyone to you, filled with anything. My own father, your grandfather, who is dead, spent his last years with his mother and their existence was pitiless. He was an alcoholic and had regressed. He no longer had the strength to parry anything. He had let everything slide, just sat there drinking. That he did so in his mother's home is significant. She had given birth to him, she had cared for him and carried him here and there, made sure he was warm, dry, fed. The bond this created between them was never broken. He tried, I know that, but he couldn't do it. That's why he stayed there. There he could let himself go to ruin. No matter how crippled, no matter how hideous, it was also love. Somewhere deep within there was love, unconditional love. He goes on, I'll stop there. It, you can see how good it is. Um, or I think it is anyway. So that we, we are, and you'll hear from Sharon and from Bob about this, we're here to evoke some version of that feeling that he's writing about, which is uh, intrinsic to all of our natures, intrinsic to all of our beings, whether you know it or not. And if you make a little room as we already started doing at the beginning, uh, you just might come in contact with it. And I hope you do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House US membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special tours with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.org.
U.S. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.